Warning, this episode of Monarchist Minute contains controversial opinions from yours truly on the issue of suffrage, and I did not get to fully express my views. If you are concerned, please see the comments section. Thank you, and now back to our regularly scheduled Monarchist Minute. Welcome to your Monarchist Minute. Royalist News in the US of A, I'm Victor Smith, and we actually do have some news. The South Sudan has restored their monarchy. Woo-hoo. Partly. A small oh. part of it. There's a okay. part that did it, not the whole government. It's a subnational tribal monarchy, but it's still a win. Woo-hoo. Yay. All right. So, what are our thoughts on monarchy as well as colonialism, which is our main topic of this evening and joining us special as a special guest this evening along with william stone charles york is darth kilhoon hey so guys. do does do one of you guys want to start us off on the uh, discussion of monarchy and colonialism well I, that- I was the one that brought the topic forward victor it's only right that i start the conversation of course. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. According to the article, which I don't know if you guys have it pulled up or not, I'm assuming you do, Victor. Don't assume these things. If you, <laughs> if you learned anything, it's that you can't assume anything. That's yeah, the yes, assumption I, you can make. The first I'm carrying the but the article states that the last king of this particular tribe was killed in action against the British 120. Mm-hmm. Now, this brings up an interesting topic in conversation because in a lot of modern Republican circles, one of the big things you hear about monarchy is how it has negative connotations to do its association with colonialism. But in my opinion, this article and this entire situation disproves that notion. It blows it entirely out of the water by proving a statement that colonialism and the imperialism of European powers destroyed far more monarchies than it had enriched. With, in my opinion, the prime example being Qing Dynasty, China. Well, first it's pronounced dynasty. What? It's pronounced a dynasty. What? Anyway, oh, well, uh, that is the British pronunciation of the word. I also spell my color with the U. <laughs> Anyways, Darth. Okay, 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 brutophile. Okay, anyways, Darth. <laughs> so, I, I just blame the British for this because, uh, you know, Britain is the home of this degeneracy called liberalism. And uh, everywhere that they touched, they infested the world with it. So that's why um, uh, they tried to kill off all these regional monarchies in the name of their monarchy was to secretly implement the liberalism across the world. Now, I don't have a theory like that. I have a theory that's similar. And it has to do with the fact that most of the colonial governments weren't monarchies, but they were oligarchies and that the... um. When decolonization happened, A, the oligarchical administrations already existed, and B, America had a lot to do with that through the UN, and we pushed for republicanism. And of course, the theory was, especially in a lot of these nations where multiple ethnicities, tribal ethnicities existed, that a republic would be needed in order to make sure all ethnicities are represented equally. But as we would later see, the only thing this did was increase the tensions and stir the fires of ethno-nationalism and result in tyranny and genocide, as we saw primarily, most specifically in Rwanda, but also in other places of the world. And uh, I would I would say specifically that that monarchies are actually the best way of dealing with a nation that is um, 
well, a nation of nations, a multicultural state, because one nation is specifically a people, so a nation of nations is sort of an oxymoron. But um, I'm reading Blessed Carl, uh, Charles of Austria, A Holy Emperor and His Legacy by Charles Colomb. I wonder who my favorite author is. Anyways, um, and he and it, the, the administration of the dual monarchy and the way that Charles envisioned it, Blessed Emperor Charles, or Carl, as I say, envisioned it after the war, where it would be more uh, federalized and the Hungarians wouldn't be ruling over the Slovaks and the, um, you know, and the Croats and all that. Um, it really, it, it would have it would have presented a far better solution because monarchs and the Habsburgs have been used to this uh, ever since their days as ruling over the uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, they they always had to deal with different nationalities. The, the Habsburgs never saw themselves as Germans, and in fact, uh, Blessed Emperor Karl always maintained that the Austrians were a different thing than Germans, right? I mean, despite the fact that they spoke the same language. And so this administration of different nationalities, because monarchy is a personal form of government, and that the king, despite the fact that the king may ethnically be uh, German in this case, uh, well, kind of, and your nobilities tend to have a lot of yeah. different blood in them by definition, but uh, d d regardless of what ethnicity the king is, he has to be a father to the different peoples, especially in uh, the case of Austria-Hungary, where it wasn't just uh, Karl as emperor of Austria, but he was also king of Hungary and king of Bohemia, and uh, and in the very last days of the empire, king of Croatia. So, hang on a second. Wouldn't it be Archduke of Austria? Technically, Austria was made an empire in 1806 after, uh, as a sort of escape hash to prevent uh, Napoleon from claiming the Holy Roman Imperial throne. And so, um, oh, also, that's the worst timeline I can imagine a liberal sitting on the Holy, Holy being the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, well, not the worst timeline I can imagine. But as a Napoleon fanboy, I have to say I like the sound of that timeline. So, no. so I mean, it, it depends on what time frame you're talking about, Napoleon, because like towards the end of his life, he was a lot more reactionary than he was earlier on. So there is that. Um, yeah, but I would never, if, if, I would never really call him a conservative in the in the real sense, given that, but, as far as I'm aware, is he only viewed the church as a means of, uh, he only viewed the church as valuable in France because France's identity was with the church and it was a way of, you know, maintaining power, so, yeah. But, but I mean, that, that is true. But to get back on, uh, oh, sorry for cutting you off, Darth. Oh, I, I just wanted to mention, like, the whole, like, the idea of Germanism actually in the, um, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire was actually very different than we think of the German idea of ethnicity. Like, most of the Austrian portion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were ethnically German, yes. But there's a lot of people in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire that claimed to be German, but were not ethnically German. Because in a lot of the major cities, like, the, like mo most of the middle class... The ones that owned the shops, ran, were skilled tradesmen, all these things. They spoke German and identified as German to be part of that social strata of Germanism within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that's what you saw, especially a lot in, like, say, what would become um, uh, Czechoslovakia, what in Hungary, the, the claimed Germans in Hungary and in Transylvania, most of them were not ethnically German but were these middle-class individuals that chose to stop speaking their native tongues or made their families stop speaking their native tongues and instead speak German and identify as German to get into that higher social strata of being German. It's a very unique thing to the Austro-Hungarian Empire that you didn't see a whole lot in the rest of Europe where non-ethnic people were claiming to be Germans. Hmm. And, um, and of the opposite, and if, if I want to point out the ultimate counterexample to Austria, which is Belgium, the nation state of Belgium literally would not exist without the king of Belgium. Hmm. There is a Belgium that I've been in contact with 
who identifies himself not as Belgian but French because of the part of Belgium he lives in. Yeah, the yeah. Belgium. There is no such thing as an ethnic Belgium. Bel Belgium is just sort of a hegemon. It's just sort of a thrust together between the Flems and the Walloons, and one it, of them is more French, and the other is basically Dutch but Catholic. It was intentionally created by the British as a buffer state to keep France and Prussia from killing each other. And, and we so counter kind of example for that. World War One. When Germany just said, "You know what? I'm just gonna walk straight through." Hmm. So, so no, I, I'm going to I'm going to give the Belgians some credit. Um, it wasn't just the British. It wasn't just that. Like the Belgian revolutionaries, they it's mostly because they were Catholic, being occupied by a Calvinist, Pro um, uh, yeah, by a Calvinist Protestant, um, uh, United Provinces. It was called at the time. And they wanted their independence and to make a Catholic state independent from it. And conveniently, the British and many of the Catholic powers supported the Belgians in their revolution. And you saw these two camps of the Belgians, which were the Belgian liberals, also tended to be Catholic, but then also the Belgian um, uh, reactionaries that the reactionaries ended up winning the day in the long run and establishing a Belgian monarchy. Um, and the liberals kind of had to, they got their parliamentary um, monarchy as their concession. But the, the Belgian Revolution was very organic, too. I'll mm -hmm. say that. And just to throw a little more love to the Belgians, um, Belgium, despite the fact that it was made up of two different ethnicities, because ethnicity isn't everything, every monarchist, a monarchist who is purely focused on ethnicity doesn't really get it in my opinion given that you know but I, I, mon I say, I say they're not talk, um disguising themselves as a monarchist yeah and but belgium uh used to really be its own nation and it's only been since belgium since the prominence of the belgian monarchy and specific and also the church in belgium has started to fall apart that belgium has started to more split along its national lines because if because what unified them in the first place was their religion. So, and what kept them unified was their religion and the monarchy. So, when you remove those two things from the equation, by and large, it's not surprising that nationalism is sort of flaring up. And I wouldn't be surprised if, at the current rate of Belgium didn't exist in a few decades. But to um, get back on topic, to talk about monarchies in relation to colonialism. I think there's a lot of interesting topics, I mean, a lot of interesting historical tidbits where colonialism actually does more damage to the institution of monarchy on a global scale than it actually helped in the form of helping the European empires. I mentioned Qing China already, but there's also the, um... India? Yeah the many Native American nations. India India is a strange case. Yes, the Mughals got screwed by the British, but a lot of the smaller feudal nobles ended up aligning themselves with the British, and that's where we get the many Rajas of India, and they benefited a lot. Well, and... Well, that, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, continue. Oh, okay. But, um... Yeah, especially in Africa and the Americas and other places through Southeast Asia, we see a lot of monarchies that were annihilated or puppeted and forced into irrelevancy by colonialism. And yeah, Vietnam used to be a monarchy until France had basically made it an irrelevant puppet, and as a result the independence movement that arose in Vietnam tore down the monarchy because they saw it as a symbol of the French colonialism being a French puppet. And, but, the, but contrary-wise, there's also examples where monarchies, uh, colonial monarchies, continue to have monarchical structures in their administration. So Spain... Uh, which this is gonna this is actually gonna shock our, a lot of our audience, depending on exactly how messed up their public education was. But the Spanish didn't just destroy everything in Latin America that they touched, um, with the exception oh. of like the 
the Aztecs or who they killed because who, whose system they completely wiped out because the Aztecs were terrible to everybody around them. Um, wait, they, wait. They, so you mean to tell me that European intervention actually saved lives? Yeah, but I mean, more more importantly to the discussion. Well, not more importantly, but um, what what happened was is that a lot of these, and I can't remember what they were called uh, on the uh, you know called off the top of my head, but a lot of the native tribes tribal systems were kept in place, and they were just sort of protectorates under the king of, king king of Spain, and this system remained intact until after independence and when independence came around the liberals who we kind of helped with spreading our masonic lodges and all that nonsense and liberal ideas into um it's a lot in america because if there's one thing that we <laughs> americans explore perpetually it's half the gamer moment he is going off about masonic lodges I, you're, yeah, okay, okay, Santa Ana, hold on, hold on, hold on. Santa Ana, was, who was captured by the Texas Rebels, they were going to kill him until he get, did the little Masonic sign thingy. That's the only reason they didn't kill him, is because he was a Mason. That, I'm, I'm sorry. But anyways, no, no, no. So it was, it was these liberal factions that took over, partly with our help, uh, after independence from Spain. And, and most of the natives actually were loyalists to the Spanish crown. It was the... Um, uh, what was the Europe, ethnically European, but not born in Spain class? Uh, the mestizos. No, the mestizos were no, the mixed. Those, those were the mixed. I... Mestizos are a mixed race between Europeans and natives. I forget all the um, Hispanic ethno. Classes. But categories. the, but the, but the class there, there were two. So uh, because the Spanish didn't want colonial oligarchies like what we had in the United States. The Spanish who were born in Spain were technically socially ranked higher than the ethnic Spaniards who were born in the colonies uh, because they didn't want colonial oligarchies like what conveniently overthrew uh, the uh, British rule in uh, North America. Funny that. Um, but it didn't end up working, obviously. But it was, it was those sort of upper class people in the colonies that were the ones who were advocating for revolution. And it was the Indians, the natives, by and large, who were the royalists and formed the bulk of uh, native royalist sentiment. And Peru uh, basically had to be forced into independence by its neighbors. It's like, you will be liberated as they're clobbering Peru into oblivion. So, you know, so, I mean, really, it just it, when it comes to monarchies and colonialism, it depends on the I guess the animating philosophy of the government which is colonizing if your government is liberal and sees your monarchy at home as completely irrelevant it's obviously not going to take uh native uh monarchical institutions into account like the british because the british would just see it would just use it as uh, i'm going to presume here i'm by no, by no means an expert but the british would just use it uh as a way of it's already here let's not rock the boat too much let's make it easier for ourselves whereas the spanish kept it in place because they saw it once it was christianized as a very good institution for the people um yeah the thing about britain is that especially victorian britain had that arrogance and that they just thought their system was so much better than everyone else's liberal moment really and uh, yes. Dr. Luna yes. and I have some experience in a role play server dealing with that, but we will not go into that into that detail right now. But yes, Victorian Britain does seem to be very hot headed and very um we will take over the world and we will do everything we can to spread everything that Britain I think that's just Oliver Cromwell creeping into modern yes. Britain. You will drink the tea. You will say God save the queen. You will live in a <laughs> town. You will drink the warm beer and you will be happy. Uh, How dare you have anything nice? Warm beer. Uh, well, I mean, I, I never tried it, obviously. But I would be open to it. If I was if I was in London, I would be open to the concept of of, of trying warm beer. I mean, it, I mean, sure, it's only been in the last 
um, you know, 50, 60 years that the British had made any real advances in the field of cooking. But I, I'm sure that because they never really bothered to switch to cold beer, that warm beer is, is a fine alternative if you get used to it. The best thing the British did in the field of cooking is that they made baked beans a breakfast food. That's it. Uh, uh, I will counter that with black pudding. Mmm, that is so good. And did we just... Actually, is, is this going to devolve into monarchist yeah. cooking? Um, no, no, German, German monarchist food is so much better. You've actually ate blood pudding. I have eaten black pudding. It is very, very good. And now it's time to discuss a dish from my uh, from my forefather's native land, Slovakia, Haluk, where you take five sticks of butter and then some cabbage and something else. I don't care. As long as you got the butter, you're good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's move on to... Let's move on to something else um does anyone want to discuss anything in great detail i suppose we could do a q a session with anybody that is in the in the live audience we can do a q a session hosting vc uh, text chat yeah we can we can do that but in the meantime uh I, you know, reading reading about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, and, and I said before of how of how the system really worked. Um, well, you know, you might say, well, that's just how it worked on paper. That doesn't mean that anybody actually cared. But there were people um, who 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 really did care for their emperor, despite the fact that they were fighting uh, people who were ethnically the same ethnicity as them. Um, so, for example, even at the bitter end of the war. Uh, and this is and this is quoting from uh, 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 Charles Combs' book here. Um, even at the end of the well, not right now, but at the end of the war, when everything was kind of falling apart, uh, there was a group of ethnic Serbs who were fight in the Austro-Hungarian army who were fighting other Serbs, and the other Serbs uh, were saying, and you know, the Serbs in the Kingdom of Serbia were be, said just just surrender already or whatever, and and the and the Austro-Hungarian Serbs said, "quote You of all people should know, we Serbs never surrender." <laughs> quote you know so i mean it's just that that loyalty to something because you know i mean ethnicity ethnicity i guess has its importance just because that's because ethnicity and culture tend to be related um but ethnicity ultimately isn't anything of consequence because you can have an ethnic serb be brought up in a, a croat household you know and and they and he be a croatian culturally um and I just got two Balkan for you. Rest in peace. Uh, very upset by that statement. But um, you know, so I mean, it's it, but the loyalty to the monarchy was something very tangible, and and you can even and the fact that at the bitter end of the empire, and even after the empire, when the emperor and empress were being led into exile, the fact that down the Danube there were cheers of you know, long live the king and long live the queen. Um, all these, you know, the the it's it's. Monarchy is something a little more tangible than than ethnicity, I think, and that's uh, pretty important. Anyways, ooh, we have questions. Yes, we do have questions. Uh, any new thoughts on the Russo-Ukrainian crisis or the Canadian truckers' protest? Uh, honk, honk. Darth, I will let you go first because you have not get because you did not give your opinion on either topic. Last time we discussed it. Yeah. Um. Uh. Well, first things first. I do not want to deploy to Ukraine. That's just the biggest thing. And uh, I don't. Honestly, I don't want to fight fellow reactionaries called uh, Russians. <laughs> I wouldn't say Russians are reactionary. More that they're just angry and ultranationalist. I. They're more reactionary than we. Are. If I may, I hate this whole motif traditionalists in the West are having around Russia that it's some bastion of traditionalist Christianity. I, I, it's really not. I, it, I, don't, I don't even admit that it is. Violent no. crime, corruption, poverty, and rampant alcoholism. This is a country where technically domestic violence isn't considered a felony. 
offense and people are allowed to beat their spouses as much as they want. This is well, a moral and Christian country we should be idolizing. Well, not that it makes much of a difference in practice. It wasn't that it was decriminalized. It was just taken from, I guess, the equivalent of a felony to a misdemeanor, which is still absolutely terrible. And it led to an increase of, an increase of, uh, you know, uh, abuse. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll let Dark Kaloon speak before I say what I think about the whole idealizing Russia thing. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't idealize Russia, but honestly, I don't think that an expansion of the American hegemony is is better for the world. I think, well, yeah, it's, it's not a good thing, period. And Russia's influence, you know, I would say it's more neutral than it is good on the world stage. Because at least Russia, R- Russia understands the differences between um, uh, cultures and the United States wants to hegemonize cultures. And that's why America is so absolute in our foreign policy, and we take no exception to anything. So, oh, um, go, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I will say that as as hard as it is to see Russia becoming a truly good nation, it's a lot easier for me at least as an outsider to see that than the united states becoming decent again or 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 becoming a good nation ourselves because we know because our lady of fatima told us that one way or another russia will be converted that's that's going to happen we we know it one way or another um so whether the Russians somehow, for whatever reason, decided to take all of Ukraine. And there's in the West, there's some of those Romanian, uh, or not Romanian, those uh, you know Ukrainian right um, Catholic priest, um, you know, and they they just storm up to Putin and say like, "Hey, yo, you gotta or whatever." As, think of any scenario you like. But so, let's be honest: if they stormed up to Putin, the only thing they're getting is shock. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I know, but all I'm, but what I'm, but what I'm saying is, is that maybe I don't know, and I'm not saying that it just okay because right now, would it be justifiable under just war theory for Russia to attack Ukraine? No, but could I, I see more good or at least less evil coming out of Russia invading Ukraine and us not intervening than us than Russia invading Ukraine and us intervening because if we intervene militarily. That's going to be much more. That's going to be many more lives destroyed, and that's going to be a lot more damage, and that's going to be a lot more blood spilt over over the issue. Now, I'm I'm willing to die for my country. I'm willing to die for Biden or in Pelosi as individuals, but I'm not willing to die to spread America's uh, per- perverted liberal notions across the world. <laughs> Okay, uh, and if I were going to die, I not that I have anything against Ukraine. It's just that I, I don't particularly fancy dying in Ukraine. I, I love Ukraine. Just I don't particularly fancy myself dying there. I, I understand li- that, and I feel for the Ukrainians because ever since the collapse of the Russian Empire, Ukraine has tried to express itself as a sovereign entity and always gets dragged back into whatever madness is plaguing Russia. But at the same time, I'm also in your position of, is this really something worth sending Americans to die for? I'm very happy to make it an Eastern European Afghanistan, though, and we just funnel weapons and armaments to them and make life as hellacious. No, 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 no. No, no. no. I, no. no I mean, no, this is the thing. I I do not, as as much as I think... That it would be um, unjust for Russia right now to take more of Ukraine, right? Because even though there are ethnic Russians, I acknowledge that Russia does have at least some valid claim to parts of Ukraine because those parts of Ukraine were tacked on uh, by Stalin and Khrushchev. The, The fact remains that ultimately right now, as it stands, unless there's a great religious moral conflict where Ukraine somehow becomes Catholic or whatever. Anyways. If I may interject about the whole tacked on to Ukraine part. Actually, historically, ethnic Ukraine extends almost into the Caucasus and throughout the Pontic Steppe. Stalin, during mm-hmm. his industrialization process, relocated a ton of Ukrainians 
back into the area that we now consider Ukraine because a lot of them were kulaks. They were free Cossacks farmers that owned land and they were moved out of that territory in order to make room for more ethnic Russians. They also industrialized. The parts of Ukraine that are more ethnically Russian also control a majority of Ukraine's industry. And this was believed specifically to be something done by Stalin in order to increase the Russian centeredness of the Soviet Union and prevent more ethnic nationalism from trying to tear it apart. I mean, you didn't understand um, the danger of ethno nationalism at the end of the day. And so, I mean, I will give Stalin that, that it is a powerful tool that you can use against your enemies. Um, and, uh, not, not, uh, not saying uh, I endorse Stalin doing ethnic genocides, though. Of course. And uh, speaking of, we have a question from the Devil of Bohemia that we will get to after this next topic. Going back to the subject of apparitions of the Blessed Virgin today in real time, we record on Fridays, for those of you watching on YouTube, today in real time is the Feast of the Apparition of Our Lady of Lords, and Charles York can tell you a little bit more about that particular apparition. Oh, uh, that was that was the one where our Blessed Virgin appeared and said, I am the Immaculate Conception, right? It's the one where they go to a pool at Lourdes and the Lord's water heals people. Okay. Uh, there, there's, there's, uh, if you couldn't guess, there's, there's a lot of apparitions of the Blessed Virgin. The first one took place before she even died at uh, Our Lady at the Pillar, so uh, where she <laughs> bilocated uh, from. Uh, so, so you know, there we go. Um, actually, we, we had a mass today, and I was wondering why Father was dressed the way he was, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, his his homilies. I mean, I love the guy, but his, but uh, this particular priest, his homilies, very rarely focus on um, on um, what what the actual uh, saint's feast day is. I mean, like anyway, continue, continue, it's... Charles. Oh, um, I'll I'll let somebody else uh, continue. I need to do something real quick. Okay, uh, Darth, if you have any info on Lords, go ahead. On, on Lord, um, well, I just want to make a comment on priests not really uh, doing anything for these days. Um, I just think that that's kind of the trope of post-Vatican II. I'm not saying I'm anti-Vatican II. I'm just saying that uh, the trope of the liturgical council. And uh, did you want to give a little bit more background of Lords for people, Darth? Before we move Lord. on to this question, um, just move on to the question. Okay, uh, I will give a. Basically, a lady appeared to people in Lords and appeared to someone in Lords who had some form of disease. The person was healed after they bathed in a pool, and that pool has been used for holy water ever since. Anyway, go to the question from the Devil of Bohemia. <clears throat> he was thinking about the prospect of a civil war in America. Do we think that if such a thing were to happen, there would be some way to bring people on the side of monarchy? And unfortunately, I think not. O only if I, only if the people really got desperate enough or the people on the winning side decided that, hey, this Republic thing ain't cheap and just, like, install somebody. Like, what happened in Star Spangled Crown, uh, where uh, not... Uh, which is a good book, and uh, minor spoilers for literally the first chapter, uh, so skip ahead like a minute or whatever, but what happened was is that uh, the situation in America progressively got so bad, like, to the point where uh, people stopped obeying um, government authority and whatnot, like, like, <laughs> like white and black supremacists stopped bickering with each other just to defend a courthouse where a judge refused to acknowledge polygamy, and so the feds were trying to remove him, and it got that bad, and the lady president, like, tried to deploy the nukes or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, so what happened was, is that the military essentially accidentally cooed the president who got off her rocker 
uh, and they were sitting around figuring out, uh, trying to figure out what the heck they were going to do because they didn't really anticipate this. So they just said, uh, and they realized that the Republic wasn't really working anymore. So they said, and so one guy was like, how about a monarchy? And they were like, uh, and the guy's like, what, you got anything better? <laughs> so that's how, that's how the monarchy came to be. Uh, so unless something like that happens, which is highly unlikely, I don't think. I mean, maybe if in 40 years or whatever, and American monarchism is a much more of an established prospect, then we might, then maybe a monarchist faction could sweep into power and whatnot. But right now, I, it would be just, you know. Well, so, I, so yeah. I, I think that it would be kind of like a Franco. We need a Franco figure. And it would be like 40 years of like integralist Catholic dictatorship before you could install a monarchy and have it be accepted. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I mean, even then, the problem there is that most Americans, uh, most Catholic Americans in this country are more American Catholics than anything. And they don't, and they still hold to one of the uh, things that was condemned in the syllabus of errors, which is separation of church and state and separation from state from church. Um, so I mean, it would, and they are just... they're, they're very staunch um, supporters of the uh, current American government. Yeah. So because so I mean, if if America's Catholic population was was really, um, at, I mean, I don't know if if America's Catholic population was was really advocating for true Catholic social teaching. And trying to advocate for the rights of God in His Church, we could take over easy. I mean, we're we're hypothetically twenty two percent of the population, but the percentage of American Catholics who would actively support a not 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 even monarchist, but just a Catholic state, where where regardless of how that looks, the only thing is that Catholic social teaching has to take place, and the Catholic Church is the true religion and uh, the the state religion. I what is I. I, I would wager that's like a fraction of a percent of the American population, and, and, and even a, like not even five percent of the American population. I mean, I see more hope of it as the younger generation is progressively getting more traditional uh, in the Catholic Church. Those that are actually electing to stay. Um, so, yeah. Well, there are also issues, well, there are also certain issues that are not really appropriate for this podcast. If we were to do a, spe a, a specifically Catholic podcast, we could get into these issues, but we are not going to do it in a monarchist setting, which would have led us directly into our updated thoughts on the Canadian Trucker Convoy. But we will get into the Canadian Trucker Convoy now if the uh, other three people on this show don't mind we'll do it now I, I, I wanted to say something about the civil war question okay yeah, go, ahead. go ahead will you can say something about the civil war question then do I have to go ahead of a tracker convoy mm -hmm. all right so i had this idea i thought about this idea in the event that the u.s breaks down in the civil war it could be good for monarchism not in a sense that we use it as an opportunity to push the issue and basically force the monarchy into being. But we could use it as an idea to organize, use the Civil War as a justification, basically saying, see, this is the failure of the Republican system. And I call it the peacekeeper's gambit, where instead of picking a side and using that as a way to leverage monarchism if we win, we don't play any sides, and instead we try to enforce order and peace and basically get both sides to either A, come to the table, or B, with the help of a third party, reinforce peace in America with the interest of establishing a monarchy in order to prevent the partisan issue from ever getting bad enough again that another civil war would break out. But once again, uh, um, right now, we are so, like, that could work if we were a larger force, but right now we are so small that we may be able to occupy the downtown of a large city for the duration of the war, maybe, and then we get shot as traitors at the end of it. <laughs> for not for not so, siding with the winning government. 
Well, obviously, we're not in a situation to do much right now. We still have growth to do. But I still argue that playing a role as peacekeepers could look a lot more better publicity-wise and make our movement and cause look a lot more just than, you know, just falling. And then, you know, shooting our countrymen. Yeah, and so just so, falling on one of the sides of the partisan dichotomy and hoping that side wins. I I have a very, very alternative view to this because I honestly see if a civil war scenario did occur, I'd see I would see balkanization before I would see like two sides. Like it sounds like in your scenario you would see two sides. I'd see a hundred sides potentially. Like as chaotic as the Russian Civil War, but probably not leading to any unification like the Russian Civil War ended up turning into and honestly i could see a catholic like integralist movement or something along those lines possibly popping up and especially the higher density catholic population centers um because it is a powerful force that is able to unify populations um and typically when you do see these civil strifes come out like even if quote unquote we're not a religious community um, uh, you see the church upswing in popularity again. Like you saw that in the Spanish Civil War, for instance. He's a more modern um, uh, example. Yeah. Um, I think that it, I don't know. I mean, the, the realities and the failures of the American system being put out in the most uh, upfront way possible, I think, are going to be the only, is, is really going to be the only realistic way of shaking the. Uh, the Catholic American populace out of this like Americanist heretical psychoses. Anyways, uh, quick disclaimer for the audience: in no way, shape, or form are we advocating for a coup or a civil war. Oh yeah, we we're still gonna get we're still we're still gonna get busted by the feds. We're, we're like the feds. Oh, moving on, moving on to the. Canadian trucker convoy, Darth, as you live in Montana, I believe you have a front row seat to at least part of it. No, I don't. Um, I live in Michigan. But... <laughs> they're they're closing off the Ambassador Bridge. <laughs> yeah, he he's closer than I am. Right? Yeah, Montana. You know, well, Montana's like, oh, that's happening in the world. You don't notice those things. The Montanans are just, like, sitting there with their uh, bunkers there and laughing that if anything ever happens, uh, like an alien invasion happens, they can just, like, shoot the guns and then throw them to the side and then grab more guns because it's faster than reloading. Anyways, um... Is the of the United States. It may or may not actually exist. Hmm. Anyways, uh, no, no, I mean, so the, what, the, the long and the short of it is, is that the truckers are uh, upset over the vaccine mandates which had to be, you know, vaccinated if you're going to and from the U.S. and uh, into Canada. And it's spread uh, by and large, I think it's in France and New Zealand, and uh, the Canadian government, of course, isn't, <laughs> isn't, isn't very uh, thrilled by this idea. And every time I hear Trudeau speak, and this isn't his fault, I mean, it, it, I mean you know, this is just the way that he was born and it's partly genetics or whatnot but his voice is so like how does how does he have it like his his voice does not sound like a politician it's not a rousing voice or whatnot so when you hear him speak about how it's a fringe minority or whatnot it's like i'm like how how did he get elected was it like, how, why did the Canada's, elect, Canada's election system is weird? Well, no, 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 no. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know it, how it works is that the leading party gets to choose the prime minister, but, but, but how did, why did the, I mean, was it like if, if, if Trudeau's dad wasn't prime minister, I don't think he would have gotten elected. He just doesn't okay. like seem like the statesman type. Here's what you need because... to know about Canadian politics. The liberals suck, but most people see them as better than nothing. The conservative party are cowards. And what's that social democrat party? I don't remember. They're uh, the Greens. social democrat party. And they're just the, there. And the BQ, the Bloc Québécois party. Ah, uh, yes, the, the French-Canadian nationalists that 
threaten to leave every time that the Canadian government says, you know, maybe we should stop throwing money at Canada. I love the fact that the French Canadians managed to work out a system where Canada just throws them extra money for the promise of staying in Canada. I mean, if there's one thing the French Canadians are, it's resourceful. <laughs> well, they are very resourceful with their vulgar language, too. Some would call it blasphemous. Anyway. Yeah, the French, yeah, the French Canada, uh, Quebec kind of just died after the Quiet Revolution. Uh, Almost literally, too, given their birth rates basically dropped to nothing. So, uh, okay, any, that's okay. what happens when you introduce liberals into a society. Yeah. <laughs> But anyways, Hong Kong for the Canadian truckers. Uh, the funniest thing I think, I've watched a few videos of the Canadian protests, and the funniest thing I think came out of it was the phrase, the honking will continue until freedom improves. And there's a reason about that. At my last job, my boss, very nice guy, he had a poster on the door to his office. It was a poster of a pirate. The pirate was a skeleton. And it said, the beatings will continue to morale improves. And I just remember that phrase. I always loved that sign. And when I heard that saying, it immediately reminded me of that. And I just had to laugh. Uh, if, you ain't having, if you don't have a good sense of humor, then, um, then your, your political organization is dead. But the, and the thing is, they're trying to write it off as a violent protest. And... When you watch the video and you hear him say violent protest, you have to think this must be only a Canadian thing. Because no, no. he's sitting there dancing in the street, honking horns. And it's literally the Canadian stereotype of everyone is so polite. And Well, I will, well, to be fair, if you were living in a house and there were a whole bunch of truckers honking their horns at around the same time, you would be annoyed by how loud those horns get. Oh, well, yeah, but, 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 but Victor. As as the rest of the residents of Ottawa, I'm just saying the fact that the Canadians are calling it a violent protest is just... Oh, of course, of course. No, no, but Victor, you had to, look, I mean, look, not that the, not that the left cares about hypocrisy, because to paraphrase John Doyle, hypocrisy is, is only a sin to people who have morals, but, um, but, but Victor, didn't you know that uh, protests are supposed to make you uncomfortable, and that, so, so really, this is just carrying on in that same spirit of, I, I'm sorry, I can't continue with this stupid nonsense. Anyway, no, 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 I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just we should send them an air raid siren, and they can use that to. Oh, 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 but, 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 people are going to be ordering noise protection now. So when the truckers go back to their jobs, they will have to deliver uh, all this, like you know, soundproofing equipment with their trucks. So actually, this is also brilliant for business purposes because not only are they protesting for their rights, they're also protesting. I mean, this this protest is also going to result in an uptick in business once all is said and done. So that's, Wait, that's pretty smart thinking there. Victor, you're a sports expert. Remind me, when does hockey season start? Hockey season runs from November and it goes to... Who uh, like April or May or June is when the Stanley Cup gets awarded. Right. I want to see Canada, none of the Canadian teams win the Stanley Cup, then to have a hockey riot and watch Trudeau actually say what a violent protest is. Well, well, it, it, it's a cultural actually, thing. Well, I don't think any of the Canadian teams actually have a good shot at winning the Stanley Cup this year. I think the only one that really has a shot at it is the Vancouver Canucks and their division is kind of loaded right now with really good teams. Least I, nationalistic American hockey fan? I just I want know. to see the Canadians cause an absolute wreck over a hockey game and watch. Well, if you want, if you want to see that, you should be praying for the Montreal Canadiens to make the Stanley Cup final and then lose. Oh, boy. I, I, as as a red as somebody who's supposed to be supporting the Red Wings, all I can say is I know one of the teams is has the logo of a penguin, and that's that's about all I know about. Yes, that is uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're annoying. Go Blue Jackets! <laughs> 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 I 
cats. <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like a uh, this is like like a fascistic off brand organ. Were there like blue shirts or something at one point? And like some government had blue shirts like in China or something. The blue shirts were off the, the reason they're called blue jackets. No, also also French. Huh? Also, French had the blue shirts. Um, but for, there were there were several there were several blue shirts actually in several different nations that were um uh, either nationalist or fascistic organizations. But the blue jackets actually has kind of a wholesome story behind it. Um, in Columbus, we have um Worthington Industries. They're a um steel producer. They mill steel and send and distribute it to companies that use the steel to make products. And their color is royal blue. And so when you see a Worthington Steel representative, they're always wearing a blue blazer, a blue jacket. And so when Worthington Industries came to Columbus, they poured a bunch of money into the community, created the hockey team, and paid for the stadium. And that's why the team is called the Columbus Blue Jacket. Based in supporting your local economy, economy more than just financially built. It's a wasp in a blue jacket, so it's a play on a blue jacket. Also, the Spanish Legion used uh, blue shirts, and they were oh. um, uh, they were colloquially termed the uh, blue shirts as well. So. Oh, yeah. And the uh, and the uh, an old nickname for the New York Rangers used by sports writers was the blue shirts. And that's that has fallen tremendously out of favor. The Rangers have always been known as the Rangers officially, but certain newspapers referred to them as the blue shirts as sort of a nickname. Uh, and there's also the St. Louis Blues. Time to time to cancel the Rangers, because anyway. of that big connection. Well, let's do it. Hashtag cancel the Rangers. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, and to bring it all back into, to bring it all back, to circle it all back and relate it all, on Mariah feast days, which are feasts of Our Lady, Catholic priests in any corner where the Spanish Empire once reigned can wear blue vestments or could at least wear blue vestments for yeah, the priest, priest of Our Lady. The, the same priest I was talking about earlier, his, uh, despite the fact that the Spanish never were in Michigan, so I'm going to say maybe this is a French thing, uh, he, he, he had blue vestments, and I'm like, wait a minute, I thought, like, the IKSCP or whatever it's called was the only I, people who... Yeah, okay. Uh, so, that, that should be a question that you give to Charles Colum for him to answer on Off the Menu. Because he would know a lot more than me. Yeah. Uh, speaking of feast days, I believe that right now we should go to my last word, if that's okay with everyone. <clears throat> well, I mean, we can talk about St. Valentine's Day and, and, and then... Um... And then talk about some other things if, uh, if, th if that's okay, if we got anything else. Okay, then we will go to St. Valentine's Day then. A quote from the accounts of feasts and lives of the saints out of the Father Lassance Missal, published in 1954. Um, St. Valentine was a holy priest in Rome who assisted the martyrs and the persecutions under Claudius II. In the end, he was beheaded for being a Christian on February 14, 270. He was a doctor of medicine as well as a priest. One of the catacombs, and I assume here this is referring to the catacombs under Rome, is dedicated to his memory. As for why his feast day became a romantic secular holiday, I have I have absolutely no idea. If anyone can enlighten me on that, uh, please do so. I think it was because he was known for marrying couples. And and then, 
I don't know. Secular, secular. When when secular people get their hands on holidays, they'll just take like something vaguely connected and then just make it like, oh, Christmas trees and gift giving. Yeah, that's totally what Christmas is about. Yeet. Uh, uh, just... Christmas, well, Christmas trees is a very uh, Catholic German thing. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know supported. that that whole it's pagan is kind of. Stupid, but pagans. But anyways, uh, no, I just it's just that like they'll just take like things that are they'll just take little things that are you know important, and then they'll just like say that's all it's about, and then ignore the fact that it's literally Christ Mass. I don't know. With, secularism is dumb. When we did the Christmas special and you pointed that out, my mind was still blown because I still never picked up that Christmas is literally Christ Mass. Well, to be fair, that it is the old English spelling where we're missing an S, so you know it's a little it's a little disguised there. But and we pronounce it as one word too, so you don't really think about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, just, I like I like what Protestants say. Keep Christ in Christmas, and I'm like, why stop there? Why not keep the mass in in Christmas? <laughs> there was also something we celebrated just recently on February second, the Feast of the Purification, also known as Candlemas. Candle. We're supposed to bless candles. At least that's what we used to do. I don't know. Was was Candlemas was Candlemas a holy day of obligation, or no. was it okay? It was never a holy day of obligation. Not, I know, I know but, it isn't. Not in the US. But, but in the Middle US. Ages, everybody had to make their own candles, so uh, getting them blessed was was more, let, let's just say, more important in prior times than it is today. Especially because candles used to be terrible. And then, like, like candles were, like, it, 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 like the self-trimming wick that we all know and love today didn't come around until, like, the 17 or 1800s. Or whatever, yeah. like like you actually had to like be like you would you would actually had to cut the wick yourself every like twenty or thirty minutes or whatever. I don't know that, the, that, the that ultimately has nothing to do with candles. That's nothing to do with candles ultimately, but but I'm just it's like the candles at the time are just yeah. Now, question: Does it have to be a candle, or can it be any light producing object? Can I take an LED bulb and have it bless? Get your Te phone. Okay, technically, people. you can have you can have anything blessed, but it, it just the might blessing not have for an LED light bulb is not the same thing as the blessing of a candle. Yeah, there's like there's a big there's a big book uh, of 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 prayers for blessing specific things, but not everything has a specific. Prayer, like I, I think there might be a prayer for blessing of a firearm, which isn't the same thing as blessing uh, a candle or blessing. Uh, hey, hey, what weapon damage plus ten? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah. So it's, I mean, like hypothetically, I could walk up and say, "Hey, Father, I got these two little uh, book holder figurine things. One of General Grant and one of General Lee. They're 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 the same mold. It's just that one. It's just they're painted different. But anyways, uh, do you, you, you want to bless them? There might not be a specific thing, but you know, they'll just you know. Yeah, and some and uh, and uh, the other musses, if we can use that term, were Nicholas which is the Feast of St. Michael, which is in September. Uh, there's also... What were the other ones? Hallowmas? Uh, I, I, just, I just know Michaelmas, Christmas, and Candlemas, but I'm sure there are others. I mean, yeah, there, I know, it's, there may be others. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just a weird thing with how Old English... I'm, I'm going to assume it's a linguistic thing of how Old English came into New English. I mean... Uh, or modern English. I'm going to assume, like in other countries or other languages, though the the distinction of Christ Mass is going to be much more obvious. Like maybe it never lost, maybe it was never merged into a compound word or something. But you know, oh, look oh. at Easter. Easter is only called Easter in Germanic countries. In the rest of the world, it's Pascha. Yes, and uh, other cal another quick calendar note. Um, Charles the priest. Where you'll be going to Mass will be wearing green vestments on Sunday, 
for I believe it is the seventh Sunday of Ordinary Time. Is that correct? I want to say so. Yes. And uh, the priest, where I will be going to mass, the priest will be wearing purple because this Sunday, coming up in real time, the day before, if you're watching us on YouTube, is Septuagesima Sunday, which is the three preparatory Sundays before Ash Wednesday, which is the start of Lent. As for why it was removed in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the Council Fathers said that adding three extra Sundays of preparatory penance was basically repetitive and unnecessary. More Lent, more Lent, more <laughs> Lent. That's how we got Advent. The monks were like, more Lent, more Lent, more Lent. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm down for it. I'm, I'm down for penance. Let's just do it. More Lent. Of course, the Lenten observance before the Second Vatican Council was a lot more strict than the Lenten observance we have now. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into the minute differences because they are not necessary for salvation if you're Catholic right. right now. But those resources are very readily available to you if you know where to look. Speaking of strict Lent, we should pray for John. For those of you who don't know, our chancellor is a um Eastern Catholic. Is he Ruffinian, right? I think so. I think that's what he called himself. But anyway, that means Lent for him means he's basically going to be vegetarian for a month, so... No, not, not, not even vegetarian, but vegan, I think. No, he, I mean, can, he, can clarify, he can clarify for us next week. Yeah, it, it used to it used to be. I mean, for basically everybody that uh, you you got to eat, you, you got bread and water, and, and that's about it. <laughs> and that that's that. Uh, we we have it. We we modern Catholics. We we modern Catholics really don't know what uh, you know uh, uh, meal penance is. We, we we don't we don't get it. How many peasants died of malnutrition back in the day, though? Well, it's I mean you're you're not you're not supposed to fast if it's bad for your health. Like if you're, like that's why that's why pregnant women get to eat meat on Fridays because we don't want the you and know, pregnant fit. women are also exempt from fasting obligations. Yeah, and um, I think it's also what over sixty five. You're also exempt from. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe for, for I believe the. Uh, Fasting rule, I was, I believe, eighteen or not eighteen, but like the confirmation the, year to yeah, confirmation year to like sixty five, and then abstinence is like seven and up. Yeah, so uh, let's see. I don't, ha I don't have my FSSP calendar from a couple of years ago on me now. I threw it out, otherwise I would consult it. Hmm. Oh, actually, uh, there's a bar in um, a local uh, community that sometimes uh, people go to, and obviously I don't uh, go there frequently, obviously myself, but they have uh, <laughs> like a Catholic calendar from like, that's just what it was called, from like the year, uh, I don't know, from, I, can't, I, I deleted the picture, but it was like the late 1800s, early 1900s, and had all the days of fasting and abstinence on it, and I'm like, that's kind of cool and useful, you know. They 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 should they should uh, make those things like like these full size things that you're supposed to hang up in public places, you know. And maybe <laughs> that's an idea if we ever secure control of the state. So well, check it down um, square. Anyway. Well, well, well. I will. I will once again reiterate that all of this stuff. The only thing that is, if you are Catholic, the only thing out of all of this particular thing that is necessary for your salvation are the modern rules as defined by the the uh, latest update to the can to canon law which I believe the latest promulgation was in 1983 so you don't have to but I but you don't so that is the only one that is in force right now. All of the older ones you can still do as pious tradition, but those are not necessary for your salvation. Following the 80, uh, provisions of the 83 code are necessary for your salvation at this point. 
Anyway, we are getting so bogged down into the Catholic weeds. Let's come up from those Catholic weeds and let's talk about another monarchism topic if anyone wants to talk about another one before we wrap up. Uh... So, um, uh, I, I want to talk about this great monarchist um, uh, called Baron von Ernberg. Um, uh, there's actually this great vid there's this great channel called uh, The Fascist Fist. He's uh, mainly a fascist YouTuber, but uh, I mean, actually, Odyssey now. He doesn't really, he's not on YouTube anymore. But he did make a great video about the about the Mad Baron of Mongolia that I think everybody should check out. Wasn't so, uh, could you... stranded out after the Russian Revolution, and he basically became a Khan in Mongolia. Uh, yeah, he did, and he wanted to create like a Central Asian Empire, and he wanted to use that to restore the Russian Tsardom. That's why he took over Mongolia. That's and, uh, fantastic. He, yeah. That's one of those things where you know the saying: sometimes history is stranger than fiction. That is one of those things. The fact that yeah, he has been significantly nerfed in Kaiserreich is is, uh, a, is a grave humiliation, almost as grave as the Kaiserreich devs' continual war against hats. <laughs> and there's your compulsory Kaiserreich reference. Because yes, we like Kaiserreich. Get, get over it. Of the monarchist Every community monarchist. in the 21st century is a mod for Hoi 4. <laughs> Look, okay, in all okay, in all honesty, as much as this makes us seem like LARPers, um a lot of like if, if there's one thing that the video game medium has done, it has opened up avenues for people to explore uh these topics and become familiar with them in ways that previously were only really available to them if they went to the library and like who wants to do that? Eh? I yeah, mean, I my I, I think more people know about Kaiser Wilhelm now than they did in, like, 1945. Yeah. Kaiserreich did more to not just revive monarchism, it revived ideologies like syndicalism. It's what brought um, Huey Long back into prominence. Most people learned about Huey Long because he was referenced in Kaiserreich. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I mean, man seeing <laughs> Whether we man. like to admit it or not, Kaiserreich is very culturally important for the for the fringe political horizons of young Americans everywhere. It, not just Americans, okay. it's like the whole world. If you are, if you have a fringe, let's just say that if you have a fringe ideology, <laughs> even if you have never played Hoi Four and you had this ideology introduced to you by a friend. Let's just say that you owe the Kaiserreich devs uh, something, which is very funny, given that they're that I'm going to wager, given that some of their focus trees, they might all be social liberal or uh, social democrats, because the social democrat bias is showing. And if you're some leftists that are calling us right wing larpers, let me ask you something: How many political references have you made using Harry Potter? It's no different. <laughs> and yeah. speaking of Harry Potter references, the uh, people that are unvaccinated from COVID are actually calling themselves pure blood. Are you <laughs> serious? I am uh, serious. I, I, I what, okay, is. once again, we love Kaiserreich, but I just it feels like there's something different because in your fantasy world, whatever, you guys have wizards who don't understand how magic works or whatever but in our fantasy world we get to uh we get to you know read about events and solve a mystery in the legation cities or try to anyways so our fantasy world actually makes historical sense yeah it's actually tangible well i, I mean, mean what are the uh, some of the old focus trees were kind of and of course if any harry potter fans are unvaccinated and they were legitimately calling themselves purebloods, they need to reread books and see who the purebloods actually were in the source material. Because... <laughs> Just kidding. I, I didn't... I, I, here's, here's, my, here's my thoughts on Harry Potter from having literally seen, like, two of the movies. Uh, I'm not a fan. I don't know. Lord of the Rings is more my style. 
I prefer Lord of the Rings too, but Harry Potter is a very good movie. Like if you just need something to play in the background while you're doing something else, to just let it go. Um, oh, I did see the original Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. I thought that was fine until you know they. I saw that the sequels coming out and they forced the gay stuff on it. I'm like, of course they did. Uh, oh, did they? I didn't see. Yeah, it. apparently Dumbledore's gay now. Well, that well, the Dumbledore being gay was that, known. That came from a tweet. Yes, right. that came from yes, that came from a tweet. That didn't come from anything in a movie. Oh, should we talk about how um, J.K. Rowling played woke and went broke because now the woke mob is trying to kill her for comments about trans people? Oh, oh yeah, well, okay. you mean for heresy against the liberal regime. Okay, at the at the here's the thing. Okay, I um. I, I don't I, I she thinks that gay marriage should be legal or whatever so obviously I'm not in favor of her but it, at the very least I will say she's st stood her ground uh, did she give in on the this is probably gonna say, did she give on the woke LGB uh, the trans stuff or is she at least holding her ground on that oh she's still no, she's still God holding her God bless her okay. soul okay so no no don't don't God reaping what she so yeah, yeah. I mean, so at the very least, she's holding she's she's holding her ground on that. She 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 should she should come back to actual sanity and 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 stand where the Catholic Church stands. But um, but at the very least, because because what's been happening? I mean, I don't know. It, well, it, highly unlikely, Miss, since Miss Rowling was a divorcee already. Well, yeah, but uh, I mean, just given. Is is rolling her maiden name or her married name? I don't remember off the top of my head. Well, anyways, it does. It's ultimately not relevant. But I just given, I don't know the the sort of ideological purity that has to exist on uh, the left, culturally speaking, with when regards to social issues. It's it's so it's so weird to see them like. Like, like, go at each other, and the the transsexuals calling people who don't necessarily support them turfs or whatever. And then, although it offends me when they call me a turf because <laughs> they make the assumption that I would be a feminist. <laughs> First generation feminism is equally as cringe as third generation feminism. Wait, what did you just say? First generation feminism is equally as cringe as third wave, wave feminism. Third wave feminism. Fe feminism. Fe 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 feminism. I mean, I had a fighting Nemo stutter. <laughs> they women shouldn't vote. Uh, look, okay, yeah. do, you need, do you need me to pull up the Women's League of anti women Suffrage and, and, and list off their reasons for why women should not be allowed to vote? I mean, I don't approve, but now my curiosity is kind of roused. <laughs> okay, and hold on. We should probably, we should probably no, 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 talk no, 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 no. about this warfare. Uh, no, no. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna make a stand. I don't. It's not that I necessarily agree, although I probably do. I don't know. I need to think about it more. But I find the reasons very compelling. Okay, the league's principal arguments against the concession of the parliamentary vote to women were a because the spheres of men and women, owing to natural causes, are essentially different, and and therefore their share in public management of the state should be different. B, because complex modern state depends for its very existence on naval and military power, diplomacy, finance, and the great mining, constructive, shipping, and transportation industries, in none of which can women take any practical part, yet is it is upon these matters that the vast interests involving them that the work of parliament largely turns. C, because the, by the concession of the local government vote and, emiss, and emission of women to county and borough councils, the nation has opened a wide sphere of public work and influence to women, which is within their powers. To make proper use of it, however, will tax all the energies that women have to spare, apart from the care of the home and the development of individual life. D, because the influence of women in social causes will diminish rather than increase by the possession of the parliamentary vote. At present, they stand in matters of social reform apart from and beyond political parties and are listened to accordingly. The legitimate influence of women in politics in all classes, rich and poor, will always be in proportion to their education and common sense. But the deciding power of the parliamentary vote should be left to men whose physical force is ultimately responsible for the conduct of the state. E, because all reforms which are put forward as reasons for the vote can be obtained 
by other means than the vote, as is provided by the general history of the laws relating to women and children during the past century. The channels of public opinion are always freely uh, open to women. Moreover, the services which women can with advantage render to the nation in the field of social and educational reform and in the investigation of social problems have been recognized by Parliament. Women have been included in royal commissions and admitted into a share in local government. The true path of progress seems to lie in, f in further development along these lines. Repres representative women, for instance, might be brought in closer consulted relations with government departments in the matter with special interests of women concerned. Only two more. F. Because any measure for the en enfranchisement of women must, one, either concede the vote to women on the same terms as men and thereby in practice involve an unjust invidious limitation or two by giving the vote to the wise of voters tend to introduce a political difference into domestic life or three adoption of full adult suffrage which seems to be the inevitable admitting principle place the female uh, vote in an overwhelming minority last one uh g because finally the danger which might arise from the concession of women's suffrage in the case of a state burton with such complex and far-reaching responsibilities as england is all out of proportion to the risk uh, run by those smaller communities which have adopted it. The admission to full political power and a number of voters debarred by nature and circumstance from the average political knowledge and experience open to men would weaken the central governing forces of the state and be fraught with peril to the country. End quote. <gasps> Seems to be an okay, okay. This is, from, this is to... from the UK. This is from the UK, by the way. I, 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 just, wanted to, I just wanted to reiterate for the people that are watching this that Charles York was reading a quote this was not his personal views on the matter. He was reading a very long quote. I just wanted uh, to reiterate that for people that may be listening to us on YouTube that are not familiar with this stuff and think that we may be misogynistic in any way. Well, um, actually, I, I am sort of convinced. Uh, hold for a second, Charles. This entire article reads like some newspaper column written by a bunch of Victorian housewives <laughs> basically for the sole purpose of insisting that how dare women have it, opinions decide being quiet and knit. Well, no, no, no. I mean, it, it says specifically that 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 the that it would be better for women to go and and talk and submit uh, submissions or whatever to parliamentary councils and how they've advised royal co commissions before. So it's not saying that women should just shut up about politics. It's saying that the, it would be better for them to pursue it through these other channels as opposed to um <laughs> as as opposed to gaining the parliamentary vote. And I will say. As this a matter, the most polite Victorian garbage I've ever heard. It's, they're basically saying no, voting is not okay, but we can still send a petition. Just vote. No, 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 no. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's saying it's saying fundamentally the men and women are uh, different in these in these in these in these areas, and so women would be better served uh, submitting their opinions via these channels, and also we shouldn't. Um, you know, disrupt domestic tranquility because that would lead to divorce and divorce is cringe. Uh, or at least I'm just uh, filling in the dots there. But I mean, and, and, but even to this day, uh, where we're, we're almost we're almost a century on from granting full female suffrage in this country, uh, we don't see as many women vote uh, running for political office as we do men. And women, it's not because women lose most of the time. Nowadays, women will will win about half the time they run compared to a male voter, right? It's just about, it's about their party affiliation more than anything. Um, so I, I will say that there seems to be uh, a, 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 there still seems to be some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, natural bias or whatever that, that, that gets women involved in politics in a different way. Bias isn't the right word. Maybe well, I don't know. A natural inclination, or I don't know. Let's call. It. Let's... Well, so, uh, Darth, you got any thoughts on this? I'm sure you'll agree well, and bolster my position. I, I just say democracy in general is cringe. So, I agree. Uh, so should, women and no one and should vote. Nobody <laughs> should vote. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, o- only the only the electors uh, should vote, and the electors being nobles and monarchs. Yeah, although I guess town councils, uh, the guilds get to decide who runs the town councils. So you know what? Okay. Oh, no. so, please don't let the guilds run my town. I don't like no. the people who run my work as is. I don't want them making policy. Well, I mean, you would you would have a place in the guild as a tradesman because you because your trade is the washing machine making. I mean, as long as we don't get a Masonic cult out of it. Labor, my yeah. guy. It's not like I run the presses. I shoot screws all day, my dude. I think this is a great place to. No, it's not. I think no, this it, is, no. I think this is a great place to wrap up. No, it is. How about not? Do you have something you want to weigh in, Darth? <laughs> no, I, I'm just saying. Um, uh, we're we're gonna storm the Bastille here, and uh, to, to um, change. Uh, well, but democracy is so cringe. <laughs> what, what else can we say that's very controversial and probably will get us banned? Um, uh, no, let's no, let's not we, do. Let's we, not we, do we, that. No, no, no. Okay, we're small enough. Nobody's gonna notice. Okay, let's. Let's let's get just close enough to the line and not cross I it. Think we, uh, I, think we've, I think we've I think we've already touched the line in this no, episode. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm sorry. Is anybody seriously okay? Okay. Even if I said I personally believe it, given how it. Huh? Charles, you question whether or not women should be allowed to vote. We touched the line. Is is that a federal offense? Is that a federal offense questioning whether or not women should hold the vote and whether or not we as we as we should hold the vote? BC chat. Leon has an idea, but it's a very. No, bad I'm idea. not gonna. We're yeah. not gonna do that. No, <laughs> no, we are not doing that. Look, I I like being able to espouse our political ideology. Thank you very <laughs> very much. Um. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's let's see. So so it all. Uh, no, but really though, is it a federal offense to uh to want to deny women uh the vote? No, it's not. So it, you know it, what? It, it may not it's be a cultural a offense. offense. It is yes. It is a very deep cultural offense that will get all of us canceled, lickety split by both fair. the left and the right. No, no, no. Okay, to be fair, though, we're already on the blacklist. I mean, there's no way that there's no way that that if if we if we could realistically show ourselves in polite society and be taken seriously and not like harassed by the online community. Like, I know Reddit isn't the example of everyday community because let's be honest, the stereotype of all redditors being basement dweller, dwellers is only partly an exaggeration, but. When you, as soon as you express the fact that you're a monarchist on Reddit, you just get a bunch of Republicans coming at you like her to her inbreeding or whatnot. Her to her. I don't want our movement to die. I'm just saying that this is not going to kill the movement. It's, okay, it's if, if we had like 50 million followers, this would probably get us killed. But right now, you know what? And if and if we get really big, I might remove this episode or I might like re-edit it. But you cannot. Tell me that right now, and I'll, I'll eat my words if I'm wrong. That this is going to get us kicked from YouTube. Anyway, uh, let's let's just let's just Darth, if you wanted to say something. God, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm good. You're good. I'm, okay. I'm good. Okay, so let's just, let's wrap this up now. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, we we just. Uh, so, sorry very well. We've opened up enough cans of worms tonight. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who don't know, we record this podcast on our official Discord server. Link is in the description. Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Links to the rest of our social medias are also in the description, as well as a link to, I, I assume we're going to put Darth Killer's YouTube channel link in the description of this video, and any links to anything that Charles may have read out of will most likely be put in the description if Charles remembers. Now, uh, our final little, uh, our final little uh, thing is that I believe February is National Heart Awareness Month, I think. And it is very important that you make sure that you are in good cardiovascular health 
And to do that, well, consult your doctor. I am not qualified to give medical advice. Uh, anyway, let us conclude in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. That wraps things up. Don't forget our news roundup for Royal American comes out on Thursdays on YouTube. So if you want more of us speaking, you can go there for more of a straight up news broadcast. Monarchist Minute gets uploaded to YouTube on Mondays. And as I've already said, it gets recorded Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern on our Discord server. And okay. so, with that, may oh, God bless. What's Hold on. Up? Oh well. Um. Uh, I will just. I. I will just say. Okay. For all you conservative women, if any of you guys, well, gals are out there. Uh. Before we. Before. Before you vote to take away your vote, vote for <laughs> for local policies because while you have it, tech. While you have the vote, technically you have a uh, obligation to vote. So. Just because you shouldn't be able to vote doesn't mean that you can't vote. So uh, that is not that is not the official. That is okay. That is not our official position per se. That is a person. That no, 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 no. Technically, the, the, I'm just. Ah. I'm. i You know what? Hold may on. May God bless. May God bless you. May this is Victor Smith signing off. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. All right, so uh, a bit of an addendum the first time we had this. Uh, so apparently there are going to be no charges filed for uh, those who toppled a Queen Victoria statue on Canada Day. Uh, so rather than just reading thoroughly through the article, we decided to open this up for everybody who is in the VC, and now we will all give our reactions to that. All right. And I will start off by saying that this is becoming more common now that no charges are getting filed because they see this, we talked about this on the main show, they see colonialism and imperialism as bad. So therefore, they are going to topple down things if they feel they can get away with it. Hmm. Apparently, uh, this is somewhat a controversial opinion in the Manitoba Police Department. Uh, some people are calling this unacceptable, which of course it is, because, you know, illegitimate as she may be, uh, Queen Victoria is better than anyone Canada's likely to get for our Prime Minister in the near future. <clears throat> can we just talk about the irony... Justin Trudeau is sitting in Ottawa right now, or wherever he's cowering like the little child he is. And he had the nerve to call the trucker protesters that are just driving around town honking horns, violent protesters, and a threat to democracy. And these people committed actual vandalism against a historical monument, and they get no charges. None whatsoever. It, it, isn't it great living it, in a it's free country? Because, so it, it's just a demoralization of our of Western civilization that they want to do. I guess it pays so, to be a commie, I suppose. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it pays to be a French Canadian. That's what the, the maple. The maple. You know uh, what is it? Uh, the maple leaf. At least the French did. At least the French. Did something right, even if it was just the protesters. Uh, uh, violent ones, violent ones. Well, uh, well, not, that not that what they did was right. I'm saying that at least they got away with what they're doing. Not that I think how it to get was away good. with vandalism. Be a little, step one. Be liberal. <laughs> and, anyway, uh, this profit. was anyway this was just a short addendum because we were not prepared with this story earlier in the day, as we should have been. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America.